Howdy, we're moving on to video two. Risk management, risk assessment. So we cannot talk about all business risk because of our dynamic environment. I just read an interesting article by Thomas Friedman, who many, many years ago wrote a book, I think it was called The World is Flat or something. And he says there's actually three types of climate changes going on now. There's a climate change everybody says is happening in the actual weather, <clears throat> but then there's another, quote, climate change in technology and the third in the globalization. And so when we talk about the business environment in the quote old days, we had more predictability. But now we see globalization taking on where if something happens in another country, it might affect our market. Uh, if something happens in technology, it might affect our market. Uh, I've mentioned Harvey before when I finally was able to get my safe open, which was another risk assessment story. I had a safe bolted to my bedroom floor, small safe, because my uh, nephew, who lived in Houston near me, had had his house burgled about five years ago on New Year's Day, 10 a.m. in the morning, and they picked up his safe and carted it off, um, which was really sad because the safe, his safe, which was small, contained all of his architectural drawings that he had done uh, at his bachelor's at uh, Texas A&M, his master's at Rice, uh, his work he had done, uh, paper drawings he'd kept it in the safe, and his Aggie ring. So the burglars stole the safe and carted it off, even though they couldn't, you know, possibly ever get it open. And if they ever get it open, they're going to be very disappointed in what they had, although for him it was a significant personal loss. Uh, so I had my safe bolted to the floor. So what happens is when Harvey floods my bedroom, the safe, even though it was fireproof, <clears throat> was not floodproof, and the water got in the uh, mechanics, and I couldn't get the safe open. And after several weeks of dealing with other crises, I managed to get my safe open. And so what do I find? I find an old bunch of iPods. I find a, an old computer, my backup computer, obviously ruined. My point being, <clears throat> the technology had changed. If I tried to give those iPods away, why would you want an iPod when you can stream music? And, you know, what, you know, what is all this stuff? Uh, so, so keep that in mind. We're talking about business climate change and technology change. I think that was very insightful, Mr. Friedman. So I'm not going to go through these because these are your classic definitions. And quite frankly, they're in the book because this book is to prepare you for the Security Plus exam, which, by the way, if you're interested in taking that exam, please contact me. I would encourage uh, <clears throat> some, not all of you, to do it. But I've started small businesses, I've run small businesses, I've run businesses for investors. All of this stuff, revenue management, cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. I always tell young entrepreneurs, you know, the uh, real estate, it's location, location, location. In uh, a business, it's cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. Contract management. You know, all of this, there's examples of business risk. Uh, there's a court case that just happened uh, that I read about the last couple of days. I won't go into the details, but it's in the contract. There was a cybersecurity um, breach and they had all these third party vendors and they had in this insurance and it became this complicated entanglement of contract management of contracts, vendors, partners, indemnification, who's going to pay. Uh, <clears throat> I believe the, uh, the the company that was breached did pay and then they turned on somebody else to pay them back and you know, nah, 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 nah. it's going to take years for them to settle it, but it's contract management. Fraud. What happens when bad things happen? Uh, Environmental risk management, meaning more not the not the environment like air, water, uh, but environmental risk in what affects the environment. Uh, <clears throat> if any of you ever think I want to be an entrepreneur and want to meet me for coffee or something, I can tell you some horror stories of risk I had to overcome. One of the biggest was which I, uh, in 1991, I had a business, I had a million dollar contract that the government was getting ready to sign. It's going to be over a couple of years. I was manning up for the effort. And all that went away when uh, <clears throat> we invaded Iraq. The contract was pulled for the convenience of the government, rightfully so, to put all the resources of that particular government agency uh, to, uh, to support our war fighters. That's an environmental risk, right? That's what an environmental risk means. I'm having to man up if I get the work, but oh my gosh, now I can't, I'm not gonna get the work, what's gonna happen? Regulatory risk. <clears throat> You hear a lot about politics, how we're over-regulated. We have the EPA, the you know SEC, the FTC, all these places that we have to do the regulations. It's the same thing. Uh, if you're in violation of a regulation, the court can shut you down. They can come right in and give you an injunction and say, you cease business until this problem is taken care of. These are all business risks. 
uh, business continuity. We talked about this last chapter. What happens when you're having a, a, a restoring after a disaster major disruption? Please keep in mind business continuity and disaster recovery, not the same thing. Technology. There's a company called Osborne. Most of you have never heard of it. Mr. Osborne wrote a lot of books. Osborne Press was big. At a certain time in programming, you had your library full of, of Osborne books. He will be forever remembered as inventing and marketing and developing and putting to market, if he didn't invent it, the first, quote, portable computer. Now, it was a big, honking, transportable computer. It was huge compared to today's standards, right? <clears throat> well, why don't you hear about Osborne anymore? Well, because Osborne 1 was such a great success that Mr. Osborne announced Osborne 2 would be coming out that was even better, and people who had orders for Osborne 1 canceled their orders. What did I tell you about small businesses? Put it in cash flow. The company actually went bankrupt and couldn't deliver on Osborne 2. It's a technology risk, self-inflicted in that case. Usually we think of technology risk as something comes along that's going to disrupt our business, but in that case it was uh, self-disruption. So we've got technology with security and privacy, big one now, GDPR. If, you, if you're not taking my law and policy class, put GDPR in your Google and, and keep that and, and keep that monitoring that situation. Uh, IT type operations, business system control, you know, your controls. We talk about putting in manual and automated controls. Well, all you need is one individual that circumvents those controls, right? Uh, <clears throat> business continuity management, information system testing. These are all examples uh, of technology risk. So we're talking about business risk, technology risk, environmental risk. My point in presenting these is not for you to be able to say, you know, on a test, give me examples of five project management risk. I want you to see the totality of what makes risk assessment, risk management so hard. Try to put down all these risks that could happen. Uh, Sometimes people ask me, whatever possessed you to, to start high-tech businesses, to do startups, to quit your job, a very secure job once at the university after I got my PhD, and go out on a limb? And I'm like, yeah, you know, when you, you're right, it must have been either youth or uh, <clears throat> sometimes ignorance because the risk that you're actually going to make it, right? Uh, and, and a good business person is good at assessing and managing a totality of these risks. So we talked about this, we, we're strategies for risk mitigation lessens the risk, all right? We've got a chapter on change management, configuration management. Again, you know, uh, people always talk about apps and going to develop apps and they're going to make money and all this. Do you know something like 60% of apps never see their second version, right? <clears throat> it's a configuration change management issue. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So the change management, when I talk about change management, I want you to think of it overarching. I'm going to change my business paradigm. I'm going to change my technology. It's going to be a big configuration management. It's kind of getting in the weeds. Uh, and it's, again, physical and electronic, okay? Uh, you know, we, we do systems engineering, configuration management. Systems engineering is, uh, I used to be called a systems engineer. Systems engineering is basically we get everything getting together and having it work. And if you don't want to think about the complexity, next time you're on a plane, think about somebody developed the avionics, somebody developed the navigation, somebody developed the cabin control, uh, environmental control. So you've got oxygen and <clears throat> you're not freezing or you're not being baked or this and that. And systems engineering is, okay, how are you going to put all those disparate pieces together and have it work uniformly, right? Have it work like it should. Same thing happens here. I'm going to be putting in, um, I've, I've talked to people in oil and gas and IT people and they'll say, you know, we have like 150 vendors in, in, our, uh, in our IT systems. You know, when you figure the hardware, the software, uh, the consultants and all of this. So, when we talk about change management, it's not just saying, okay, I need to go take widget A out and put in widget B, or I need to take software version 2.1 and upgrade it to 3.0. No, I have to worry about the entire system, how this is going to impact. So that's what configuration control is, that only approved changes are allowed to be implemented. <clears throat> Many times you get out of school and you think, oh boy, I'm going to go change the world, and you go into work for a large enterprise, and, and I've been there. Okay. One of the lessons you learn is, you get there and you think, boy, everything happens so slowly. We could do this and we could do this and we could do this. Well, that's because when the configuration management has to be a controlled process. 
Now, in the old days, we used to just call it testing and doing this and that and before operational. Now we have the digital sandbox or whatever you want to call it and say, okay, let's put this in. Let's check these configurations are going to work like we think. First problem. Second problem is the changes have to be approved. So one of the things you'll see in a good company, a technical company that's doing risk management is a control board. And they meet periodically. Typically, uh, one company I worked with and did consulting, they worked weekly. And uh, they met weekly, I'm sorry. And they had a list of changes. And some of them were, wow, those would be nice. And others were like, oh my gosh, we need to get this done. And they could call an emergency meeting if necessary. But they they had only approved the changes. You know what? These, these that could be nice, we're going to put them in our new product release that comes out in six months. These that need to be done, right? So all that is, is a systematic approach to configuration control and change management. We're going to have a chapter on incident management. I've got to tell you, after risk assessment, I love incident response and management. If you're looking for a career in cybersecurity, incident response, incident management now is very hot. Uh, and again, you have to have a response as a key risk in that. I go through my neighborhood, which as I said, was devastated by Hurricane Harvey, and I see the buildings that are now vacant. I have no HEB in my neighborhood. I'm going into HEB withdrawal because HEB had a tiny HEB store. If you're familiar with Houston, it's uh, in Meyer Land on Brayswood. The third time it flooded in three years, they made a business decision they would not reopen. Now, about four miles from me, they've opened a new great HEB. The previous before they opened that one, the next one was six miles. We're, we're driving to four miles or six miles to go to the grocery store in Houston isn't like driving four miles in College Station, okay? I'm not driving six miles to a grocery store. If I happen to be in that neighborhood, maybe I would have stopped at that great HEB. Now they've opened one, <clears throat> and within a year or two, they're going to have one back in my neighborhood. Now, it was an incident. What did I tell you? They made a business case. Uh, they did not open the HEB in my neighborhood. Um, they, the, the sad day was not only did they decide not to open it, but they painted over the HEB uh, on the empty building, which they cannot lease now, the, the, the owner, because of the flood insurance. You know, they're going to have to do modifications or somebody can't get in flood insurance. Uh, <clears throat> this was an incident. They had to respond to the incident. The store is flooding for the first time, uh, for the third time in three years. The first time it flooded, it was closed for six months, Okay. First of all, you have to respond. Meanwhile, HEB or any other business, banks in my area flooded, things that people, you know, you, you can't go into your bank and get into your um, safety deposit box. Uh, you have double whammy because you cannot call on people to help out because they are dealing with their own personal situation. So the whole idea of incident management, now take that to a cybersecurity attack. Uh, if you've never been in an incident, an emergency like that, you're at adrenaline rush, you're trying to deal with something. Again, it's a key risk. Are your people going to burn out? Can you get the right people? Uh, let me tell you another story real quick. Maersk was a victim of ransomware last summer, M-A-E-R-S-K. -E uh, if you don't know what Maersk is, large global, global, global uh, supplier. You can see Maersk trucks, Maersk uh, 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 on the highway, you can see MERS containers on ships. 95% <clears throat> of the world supply chain somehow involves shipping. They got hit by ransomware. Their operations cease. They shut off the systems. They're out of Denmark. When my friends showed up in Houston to uh, come to work, the systems are shut off. And a key part of their incident response strategy is communication. Problem was, all their list of people to call, now we're talking about a company that has tens of thousands of employees, was on the computers, okay? Is, and, no, and people laugh about this, but I, I laughed about it on a Wednesday and on Sunday as my house flooded, I realized their thing about putting incident response on a computer <coughs> that is in fact compromised <coughs> and has to be shut off is kind of like me putting tape on a door to stop the water flow when it's coming in through the floor and the walls. So again, incident response. What happens to an incident? What happens to your building, business? Um, what all of this? It's such a it's such a great rich area to study, but it also can be overwhelming, and that's why we need a systematic approach. Uh, security controls. We've talked about this. I did a video on NIST, user rights and permissions. You know, that's a 
as I always or, or typically say, all good cybersecurity is based on access control, right? And access control includes rights and privileges. Can you access it? Can you change it? Can you modify it? Can you just read it? Can you delete it? Can you move it? Can you copy it? Okay. Uh, data theft, data loss, target of most attackers, uh, variety of mechanisms, hardware failures, operator errors, and the like. So you've got a lot of controls that can be employed. Uh, risk mitigation strategy. Uh, again, <clears throat> this is an overview. If you were studying risk assessment and risk management, you're going to be sleeping, dreaming, maybe nightmares, breathing, eating the NIST controls of what an actual risk assessment, risk management looks like. Then we're gonna talk about models. And again, you know, this is an overview course. Uh, you can talk about models, but the problem with models is the steps are good. You're going to identify the asset. You're going to assess the risk of threat. You're going to determine the impact, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, great. That's a great general risk management model. Now, but the problem is risk on an asset are not in isolation. So when it says impact determination and quantification, you have to worry about the cascading effects the cascading effects of a vulnerability being exploited, be it an unlocked door, <clears throat> flying a drone over to, uh, there's a video, I can't remember if I posted, if I didn't post, flying a video over uh, to figure out how to uh, make a physical incursion into a power plant substation. So <clears throat> the steps are great. Now, the steps are focused on the asset, but you have to remember the asset is hierarchical. So yes, I have my routers, servers, and all this. Now build up. Now I have a facility that has this. Now I have a company that has this. I'm not going to go through these because uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to keep my videos down. But you can think of threat assessment. Um, you know, if if you um, you know, two two events that stand out in my mind that you may not know about: 1995 gas attack, Syrian gas attack on the Shinzuko tram station in Tokyo. Uh, actually, I was in Tokyo that year. Luckily, I was not there when that happened. If you read about the Syrian gas attack, <clears throat> it was designed to kill tens of thousands of people. Uh, the, the subways went under the Diet, which is their parliament, the palace, their courts. It would be like something happening in the United States that would simultaneously take out Congress, the White House, and the Supreme Court, and the like. Um, it's a terrorist attack, right? How do, you, how do you threat that? How do you develop that threat? How do you realize that's a threat? If you read it, a very observant train conductor saw something suspicious and pulled the kill switch. And as a result, a very small number of people died. You might want to look this up. It was OM, A-U-M. Uh, when I was there in August of 95, I climbed Mount Fuji, and uh, I was very surprised. There were no trash cans around, and the Japanese are very fastidious, and that's because the trash cans had been removed because Mount Fuji was near the Ohm headquarters, and they were afraid of bomb attacks or sarin gas attacks there. Uh, within the last few weeks, they have executed the leader of that attack. <clears throat> My point is, how did, if you're in charge of risk for that system, did you foresee that? Another example here, most of you are too young to remember, 9-11 attacks in 2001. Counter Fitzgerald, 85% of their employees were killed, right? Because they were in one location. Even in Washington, D.C., our entire patent office, our entire NSA, all these critical functions were headquartered in D.C. Now we have dispersed the patent offices through the U.S. It took... Uh, um, 10 or 12 years after that, the law changed in 2013. We have an NSA backup in San Antonio, but it was that criticality. You know, it was the, the, the first attack on American soil since Pearl Harbor. How could you foresee that risk? If you're interested in this topic, uh, text me, email me, do something. Well, I guess you can't text me, email me. Uh, there's a great book about, uh, or a story about the, the uh, man who led the Merrill Lynch security team and how he had prepared for such an attack because there had been an earlier bomb at the World Trade Center in 93. 100% of Merrill Lynch employees survived. Now, part of it was luck. They weren't on a direct hit if they'd been direct hit. Uh, he did not. After he got his employees out, he went back in to rescue others. Uh, but it's a very good assessment on how he said there's this threat 
And one of the quotes was, you're trying to tell people who make a million dollars a year on Wall Street to get in line and, and do your evacuation, okay? So when we talk about the risk, we've got disasters, natural disasters, man-made disasters, terrorism, errors, malicious attacks, fraud, crime, theft, you know, uh, you've got facilities you didn't think about the level of protection you need, you've got computer systems that don't have the level that you think, data. I, I do know in 9-11 there was a woman I knew in Austin who lost her business. Um, she was doing, a, she was a PhD mathematician doing a, some kind of derivative calculation and 100% and of her clients were in the World Trade Center. So she lost her client base, right? How do you put that in a risk system? And, and let's stop and think about it. We, when we talk about impacts, we're talking about money, uh, you know, endangering people, loss of business and all that. But then you also have to think about those intangibles. You can, you can, you can breach legislative or regulatory requirements. Uh, there's a law in the books, Federal Foreign Corruption Practice Act. A few years ago, a uh, very smart Department of Justice woman named Sally Yates, who you may remember the name because she, Trump fired her when she was acting. But before this, she wrote a seven and a half page memo, legal analysis, Nothing mentions Foreign Corruption Practice Act, but unleash the Department of Justice for uh, more enforcement of this. The law didn't change. The way the law was interpreted and changed, it's a moneymaker for taxpayers. Uh, fines up to $100 million is the biggest fine I've ever heard, uh, plus a whistleblower status. If you turn somebody in and they get the fine, you're not only protected from prosecution if you participated in the bribery, uh, you also get a percentage of the recovery, so there is at least one individual walking the streets in the United States that pocketed $20 million off of this. The point being, it was a breach of regulatory requirements and law. You know, it, how do you foresee this? Then you have loss of reputation of goodwill, brand, breach of confidence, uh, you know, a Target, it took months of, uh, or years for Target stock uh, to come back from their breach, even then, you know, you go in now and you put your card in, you have a pen, you, you know, you do all this stuff. Um, so we're not going to talk about all these. I'm leaving the slides in here. Again, if you take my class, we're going to talk and talk and talk about controls, preventing controls, detecting controls, response controls. All this needs to be taken into account. And then your residual risk. What happens when you're all done? boy, I'm done, but guess what? I've still got risk that I have to monitor and control. Okay, that ends video two. Thank you for your time. We have four videos for this chapter. That's why I'm trying to rush through. Uh, be back soon.